hi everybody grace and peace to everybody today and uh, hope that everybody is conforming their lives to the Lord and his word to the best of your ability uh, none of us is perfect and the tactics of the enemy are very multi-faceted and multi-layered so help us Lord to overcome every tactic of the enemy and to discern Lord I ask you to give us all a spirit of discernment for these things um, I've had very strange events following me throughout my life uh, 20 years ago when I lived in this house um, one day I looked in the bathtub and there was a stain on the floor of the bathtub and it was a almost like a photographic image of a man and he had a scarf over his head just like this and it was kind of like this kind of like this only it was like like that um, a thin face and a, not a very attractive man but not an unattractive man either uh, and I think it was an image of Jesus Christ and like this was before I knew before I really started getting hit heavily for this persecution um, I was being persecuted but I didn't realize it at the time um, I just thought I had bad luck throughout my life um, <clears throat> but this is just to mention one of many of the strange things that has happened to me throughout my life um, also about 20 years ago um, I had a dream that uh, somebody was singing a song to me and this song went um, we will be like the sticks in the trees and we will be like the stones singing and I had no idea what this related to because I wasn't Christian and I had never read the Bible um, but I always remembered that and uh, and now I understand what it means after reading the Bible we are the living stones that make up the temple of God and we are those sticks that are in the tabernacle of peace that form Jesus Christ's tabernacle like I spoke about in my last video <coughs> Lord I rebuke all interference to me if it's your will Lord uh, so that I can do this video um, the video material today I wanted to cover is the subject is the arrows of God versus the arrows of the enemy in scripture plus uh, the crown of the covenant okay uh, the reason why I research these things is because I have been shown some things in visions pertaining to these things and instead of talking about the visions I just wanted to research scriptures related to these things so that we can see how this all ties together and that way um, it's just following God's word instead of um, instead of talking about visions which I'm very leery of doing now I did one video about my vision last week and or a few days ago and uh, I ended up taking it down because even though I thought it came from God I wasn't sure and I, I said I wasn't gonna do that anymore so uh, yeah I'll just I'll just stick to scripture um, to see if uh, what I've been shown actually uh, follows scripture and it, it always does <coughs> But um, we start in Psalm 127, 4 and 5. Um, hold on one sec.
Okay, Psalm 127, 4 and 5. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man that has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Alright, this is interesting because it's saying that your children are the arrows. Okay? But, and they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. That's in the spiritual gate. Um, I don't know why he referenced our children in this. But in scripture it does say that if the root is holy, then the branches are holy. And he referred to it again in dough, like if the, the leavening is holy, then the whole lump is holy. Uh, this relates to our offspring. So we're going to look at scriptures involving arrows right now. That was the first one. Uh, second one is Numbers 24, 8 in the New American Standard Bible Version. I looked at this because in the King James Version, um, wild ox has been changed to unicorns, which is completely absurd. Now, why did they do this? And this is because they don't want you to put the puzzle pieces together that the nations in this passage is actually the United Nations and that the wild ox is the tribe of Joseph whom they are persecuting. So they changed it to unicorns. So Numbers 24, 8 in the New American Standard Bible version then is God brings him out of Egypt um, or the modern equivalent is the sorceries of Egypt. He is for him like the horns of the wild ox. He being God. He will devour the nations who, ha who are his adversaries and will crush their bones boom, in pieces and shatter them with his arrows. Alright, so the nations or United Nations, uh, the United States is a predominant force within the United Nations, a very, very powerful influencing force. These are the ones who have back-engineered alien technologies and sorceries of time travel, transubstantiation of matter, including living organisms, using demonic attacks on human beings, using life force energy and other energy weapons that use forces, frequencies, waves, and beams to attack innocent human beings, uh, including partial sensory overlays that blend in with ordinary perceptions, among many other technologies, which are referred to as sorceries in the Bible. Okay. Numbers 23, <clears throat> 22 through 23. This is also in the New American Standard Bible. God brings them out of Egypt. He is for them like the horns of the wild ox, for there is no omen against Jacob, nor is there any divination against Israel. At the proper time it shall be said to Jacob, J-A-C-O-B, and to Israel, what God has done. Deuteronomy 33, 13 through 18, New American Standard Bible Version. Moses' blessing on the tribe of Joseph. Hold on, i got to alter this one second. <coughs> and of Joseph, God said, or no, Moses said, Blessed of the Lord be his land, for the precious things of heaven, for the dew, and for the deep that couches beneath, and for the precious fruits brought forth by the sun, and for the precious things brought forth by the moon, and for the chief things of the ancient mountains, and for the precious things of the lasting hills, and with the choice things of the fullness of the earth and its fullness, and the favor of him who dwelled in the bush. Um, 
this is a reference to the sacrifice that God provided for Abraham when he was he told him to sacrifice Isaac and then he provided um, a ram instead so God dwelt in the bush with that sacrifice because the ram was caught in the thicket or bush so uh, the fact that he mentioned this in combination with the, the blessings of the tribe of Joseph shows that Joseph is the sacrifice. And this scripture continues. Let it come to the head of Joseph and to the crown of the head of the one distinguished among his brothers. As the firstborn of his ox, majesty is his and his horns are the horns of the wild ox. Okay, so he compared him to that sacrifice. And um, he said he's the firstborn of his ox. Now Joseph was the youngest of the brothers, so he wasn't the firstborn. But to God, he is the firstborn, you see. He just compared him as the firstborn of his ox and his horns are the horns of the wild ox. Now, that's really interesting too because our horn will be exalted. The horn of the wild ox. The scripture continues, with them, with the horns of the wild ox, he will push the peoples all at once to the ends of the earth and those are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and those are the thousands of Manasseh. Um, I'm going to put in a, a link in the description box about who the, the tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh are today. And their offspring are known as Anglo-Saxons, settled in Europe, England, and ultimately the United States. All right, so the tr Manasseh and Ephraim were the offspring of Joseph, actually. Uh, so this comprises the tribe of Joseph. Uh, but we are in the territory of Ephraim, so to speak, within the United States. So there's contradictory scriptures concerning Ephraim because the United States itself, our government, has been doing incredible evil. But the tribe of Joseph, actually, a lot of us live in the United States. Okay, Genesis 49, 22 through 24, we are told that Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a spring, his branches run over the wall. The archers fiercely attacked, they shot him and pressed him hard, yet his bow <laughs> remained taut, and his arms were made agile by the hands of the mighty one of Jacob, by the name of the shepherd, the rock of Israel, by the name of Jesus Christ, in other words, he is the shepherd and the rock of Israel. So our bow, if you picture a bow and arrow, our bow remains taut like this and our arms were made agile by Jesus Christ by the name of Jesus Christ you see we are saved by the name of Jesus Christ and our weapons of warfare are not carnal but mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds it says that right in the Bible all right so Psalm 22 20 through 21 deliver my soul from the sword my only life from the power of the dog save me from the lion's mouth from the horns of the wild ox and you answer me the wild ox or tribe of Joseph is the one who saves from the lion's mouth okay and we saw Daniel getting saved from the lion's mouth he shut the lion's mouth in the book of Daniel in the chapter called Daniel um, which was a prefiguration of what we're going through now. And if you remember, he got tossed into that lion's den 
after he refused to obey the decree that nobody was to pray to um, to any god except for the leader of that country in Babylon for 30 days. Now that's highly significant because 30 days is referenced over and over and over again um, in the Bible. And I believe that this these 30 day uh, period of time references that are, are, are mentioned over and over again uh, refers to seven years of persecution plus a 30 day period. Um, but there's also a longer time frame mentioned, like three months. And I'm thinking now that it might be two rapture events. One at seven years and one month, and one at seven years and three months past the Feast of Tabernacles this year, which is October 13th through the 20th. Um, and there's also another scripture I read yesterday um, where David had uh, escaped from King Saul and uh, it was only on the second day of the feast that they noticed he was gone. So in Samson's riddle, um, it references, uh, or no, it was a, yeah, Samson's riddle where he said, if you can answer my riddle within seven days of the feast, I'll give you 30 changes of garments and 30 linen wraps. Um, so the second day of the uh, Feast of Tabernacles be the 14th. Um, so if the scripture will be fulfilled that would be within 30 days or 30 days after that. Okay, I'm still trying to put all these puzzle pieces together because uh, seven years is multiple is referenced multiple times in scripture <coughs> and so is 30 days in combination with um, the feast um, both in Samson and in that last passage where King David was <coughs> was um, escaping from, from King Saul. David was escaping from King Saul. Excuse me uh, for one minute. <coughs> uh, I'm getting under attack again, of course. They always do this to me when I try to make a video. Um, Uh, people who are in persecution will understand this. Um, this is the Holy Spirit knocking these things out. Bitch! <laughs> you see, this is because they try to make me look completely demonic so that nobody will listen to me about scripture. Alright, but anyway, um, Psalm 92, <coughs> 9 through 11. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies will perish. All who do iniquity will be scattered. But you have in exalted my horn like that of the wild ox. And I have been anointed with fresh oil. And my eye has looked exultantly upon my foes. My ears hear of the evildoers who rise up against me. All right. Fresh oil is the Levitical priesthood anointing because this is how the priests were anointed by pouring oil on their heads. The wild ox appears to be the glorified bride of Christ, probably called a wild ox because we came out of <coughs> non-Christ filled lives through this persecution and gave our lives to Jesus Christ out of necessity as a consequence of the persecution. So we came out from a wild, sinful state into compliance with God. Like a wild ox. Alright, Ecclesiastes. And an ox was also a form of sacrificing to God in the Old Testament. 
So we are the sacrifice, and you can see that right in Psalm 50, verse 5. It said, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, and those are the saints. Ecclesiastes 4.12 And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Now the arrows in the quiver, the arrows, which is what we are, are in the quiver of the Lord. And in his quiver means wrapped in the threefold cord of the Heavenly Father, His Son Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, all braided together into one cord in love and power. And it also means that we will be wrapped in the threefold anointing of living water, the blood of Christ, and the Levitical oil of anointing of the Levitical priesthood, which will be passed to us. Oops, hold on. Okay, let's look at 2 Samuel 22, 14 through 16. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice, and he sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning, and discomfited them. And the channels of the sea appeared, the foundations of the world were discovered at the rebuking of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. These passages are repeated in Psalm 18. Uh, and I believe that the arrows here referenced are the glorified bride of Christ. A lightning refers to Jesus Christ. All right. Psalm 77, 16 through 18. <coughs> the waters saw thee, O God. <coughs> the waters saw thee. They were afraid. The depths also were troubled. <coughs> the clouds poured out water. The skies sent out a sound. Your arrows also went abroad. The voice of your thunder was in the heaven, and the lightnings lightened the world. The earth trembled and shook. Psalm 144, 5-8 through eight. Bow thy heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains, and they shall smoke. Now I believe he here, when he says, bow thy heavens, I think it's actually talking about a rainbow, like make a rainbow in the heavens. Uh, Touch the mountains and they shall smoke. That's interesting too, because uh, God appeared in the Old Testament as a cloudy pillar of smoke. So what does this actually mean here? Cast forth lightning and scatter them. Let's scatter the enemy. Shoot out your arrows and destroy them. Send your hand from above. Rid me and deliver me out of great waters. Now I believe that waters here are actually speaking about waves or beams and frequencies. Waves like a sine wave of a frequency or a beam from the hand of strange children. This is the continuation of the scripture from the hand, deliver me out of the hand of strange children. And the NASB version says, deliver me out of the hand of aliens. Uh, that's weird. No, but we're not going to go down that path too much. Whose mouth speaks vanity. Okay. So vanity is false prophecy in the Bible, or that which causes false prophecy. It's a reference to this weapon system that creates uh, a mimicry of the voice of God within our minds, all right? So um, the previous verse where it said aliens, that cannot be speaking about extraterrestrials because uh, the ones whose mouths are speaking false prophecy are human beings right now. Um, they're being subjected to these technologies. 
So when it says their right hand is a right hand of falsehood, that means that their version of Jesus Christ is a falsehood or some other name that they're giving to him, such as like Yahushua or Yeshua. These are false Christs. Um, he that passes, okay, Proverbs 26, 17 through 19, he that passes by and meddles with strife, belonging not to him, is like one that takes an animal by the ears, as a madman who casts firebrands, arrows, and death. So is the man that deceives his neighbor and says, am I not in sport? I mentioned this particular passage in a previous video and I mention it again because it clearly shows that the ones who persecute us are taking it all as a joke and that this persecution program deliberately causes strife in relationships and arrows are a reference to spiritual attacks and firebrands are attacks that are set in motion by the sins of our words and you can see this in James uh, chapter 3 verse 6 or paragraph 3 verse 6 and death caused by disease that is aimed at us through these weapons such as cancer but I rebuke that cancer and I do not accept any cancer whatsoever in Jesus Christ's name Ezekiel 39, 8 through 10. Behold, it is come and it is done, says the Lord God. This is the day whereof I have spoken. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and, and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows, the clubs and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years. So that So that they shall take no wood out of the field, neither cut down any out of the forests, for they shall burn the weapons with fire, and they shall spoil those that spoiled them, and rob those that robbed them, saith the Lord God. This is speaking about the second set of seven years that I spoke about in my timeline video, when the Lord will suddenly flip everything, and the wicked devices will return on the heads of those who have been using them on us and they take no wood in this passage because the sticks of the Lord are his chosen servants and the field represents the place of safety for the chosen servants of God. This passage about spoiling those who spoiled us is repeated again and again throughout the Bible. The scripture that preceded that passage in Ezekiel 39, 1 through Okay, I'm not going to go there. This is too much. It's all about Gog and Magog and who these people are, but for the sake of brevity, I'm not going to go there. Um, let's just go to Habakkuk 3, 10 through 12. The mountains saw thee, and they trembled. The overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hands on high. Um, this reference to lifting up the hands requires another Bible study in itself. There's many important references to lifting up your hands, such as when the Israelites defeated the Amal Amalekites in Exodus 17, and Aaron and Hur had to hold up Moses' hands, and as long as his hands were held up, they defeated the enemy. Later on in the Bible, the lifting up of the hands in prayer is called the evening sacrifice and in Daniel the daily sacrifice is removed see uh, the daily sacrifice all right could very well be prayer because within the chapter of Daniel like I said earlier we saw that there was a decree made by King Darius that nobody could pray to God for 30 days Okay. only to the leader so that evening sacrifice or the daily sacrifice spoken about in Daniel could very well be referring to prayer the 
scripture continues, The sun and the moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of thy arrows they went, and at the shining of thy glittering spear. Thou didst march through the land in indignation. Thou didst thresh the heathen in anger. This is when the sun and the moon, when the earth will stop rotating, and the sun and the moon will stand still. Okay, this is also um, stopping time. Uh, because in the scripture in Job, chapter 3, I believe it was, uh, the day of darkness is referenced as a day out of time. It won't be joined to the other days of the calendar year, according to scripture. And it's really interesting because in the scripture, uh, within Psalms, the one in affliction always says, Quicken me, O Lord, according to your righteousness. Quicken me, O Lord, according to your mercy. Um, and I believe this is when the uh, 144,000, and uh, this speaks about rapture events. Because... <clears throat> Uh, scripture tells us that a thousand years is equal to a day, and a day a thousand years between heaven and earth. So if you're being quickened, you're being put in a completely different time dimension, you see. <coughs> okay. Part two of this talk is called the crown of the covenant. Uh, our covenant is with Jesus Christ through his precious blood and his sacrifice. Uh, his blood actually went down on the, onto the mercy seat when he was crucified at Golgotha. And if you look at the videos of Ron Wyatt, he actually discovered the Ark of the Covenant underneath Golgotha, and he discovered that Jesus Christ's blood had actually gone down into the earth and fell onto the actual Ark of the Covenant and um, this is the new covenant in his blood and it was literal, see, because it went right onto the Ark of the, of the Covenant. But the uh, government of Israel has, um, they have taken the Ark of the Covenant and um, this is all supposed to be revealed when the, um, when the Mark of the Beast comes about. And it'll be for a sign to those not to take it to everybody. <clears throat> yeah, but check out those videos by Ron Wyatt, the archaeologist. Extremely interesting. They analyzed the blood, and it only had half of the chromosomes from Mary. Uh, didn't have the full set of chromosomes because the Holy Spirit uh, that Jesus Christ got from God, uh, there were no chromosomes on that side. He was half spirit, half God, and half man. And his chromosomes show that. It's really interesting. <clears throat> the first scripture in this part of our talk is called Woe to uh, the Crown of the Covenant. And the first scripture is from Isaiah 28. Woe to the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim, and to the fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is at the head of the fertile valley, Boom. of those who are overcome with wine. Behold, the Lord has a strong and mighty one, or agent in the NASB version, as a storm of hail, as a tempest of destruction, like a storm of mighty overflowing waters. He has cast it down to the earth with his hand. Now, I believe this is speaking about either an asteroid strike or uh, Nibiru. He has cast it down to the earth with his hand, so it must be an asteroid strike. Proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim is trodden underfoot. Um, I talked about this scripture before. I believe that it was Napa Valley that was being referenced. So if uh, an asteroid strike caused a wave to uh, subsume or go underwater that whole area of California, that makes perfect sense. Um, 
but the scripture continues, the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim is trodden underfoot in the fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is at the head of the fertile valley, and I believe this is Napa Valley, it will be like the first ripe fig prior to summer. Which one sees? Okay, and if you look in uh, the New Testament, it tells you that when the first ripe figs uh, come, that this is going to be the sign that everything is at hand. And in this scripture it says, which one sees, and as soon as it is in his hand, he swallows it. So in other words, uh, when we see this asteroid strike on California, this is the beginning of the end. It says, In that day the Lord of hosts will become a beautiful crown and a glorious diadem to the remnant of his people. So this is the three days of darkness, and this is when the, the bride of Christ becomes glorified um, to the remnant. A spirit of justice for him who sits in judgment and a strength to those who repel the onslaught at the gate. All right, this is the glorified bride of Christ repelling uh, the forces of demons in the spiritual gate. Uh, <clears throat> and the gate is between heaven and earth. Okay, Isaiah 62, 2 through 4. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all the kings thy glory. And thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem, or tiara, in the hand of thy God. Thou shalt no more be termed, termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hefziba, and thy land Beulah, for the Lord delights in thee, and thy land shall be married. Thy land shall be married to Christ, because it will be redeemed, just like we will be redeemed. And we will be that crown of glory in the hand of the Lord. See if I can figure this computer out. First Peter five four, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, that's Jesus Christ, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fades not away. You see how this works? This is all in agreement. All these scriptures. James one twelve. Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried. He shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Crown of life. Genesis 49.26 The blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors unto the utmost bounds of the everlasting hills. They shall be on the head of Joseph, and on the crown of the head of him that was separated from his brothers. Okay, this right here tells you that the chief crown is going to be on the tribe of Joseph. And the tribe of Joseph has been the ones in persecution. Exodus 30 and 37 uh, says that there was a crown of gold around the top of the Ark of Covenant. And this crown actually will be on us, according to these scriptures, because we are... We are part of Jesus Christ's holy everlasting covenant. This is the covenant between God and between us that mankind has been waiting for. It says all creation groans and travails waiting for the glorified, uh, the manifestation of the glorified bride of Christ. Exodus 39, 27 through 31. 
These are commandments concerning the attire of the priests of the temple, or Aaron and his sons. Then they made bells from pure gold. They hung these bells around the bottom edge of the row between the pomegranates. <coughs> around the bottom edge of the row there were bells and pomegranates. There was a bell following each pomegranate. This robe was for the priest to wear when he served the Lord. It was made just as the Lord commanded Moses. And they made coats of fine linen of woven work for Aaron and for his sons. And a mitre, that's either a turban or a tiara. I think in this passage it's a turban because it's made of fine linen, which is material. And goodly bonnets of fine linen and linen breeches of fine twined linen and a girdle of fine fine twined linen and blue and purple and scarlet of needlework as the Lord com commanded Moses <coughs> and a girdle of fine twined linen and blue and purple and scarlet of needlework as the Lord commanded Moses oh that's weird that, that passage went twice for some reason and they made the plate of the holy crown of pure gold and wrote upon it a writing like to the engravings <coughs> of a signet or seal saying holiness to the Lord okay so Moses was instructed to have them make a crown of pure gold and write upon it holiness to the Lord on, on Aaron and his sons crowns and they tied onto it a lace of blue to fasten it up on high upon the turban as the Lord commanded Moses. Why is this significant? Because holiness to the Lord was capitalized in that passage and holiness to the Lord also appears in Zechariah 14, 19 through 21 and this shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that do not come up to keep the feast of tabernacles. In that day, holiness to the Lord shall be engraved on the bells of the horses. Pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holiness to the Lord of hosts. Now, everything that the Lord commanded the Israelites to create in their temple was a reflection of what exists in heaven. So when the pots are before the altar, the bowls are before the altar in heaven, this is the prayers of saints that are contained in those bowls that go up to God. The angel takes the, the prayers in the bowls to God, and this is in Scripture. I think it's in Revelations. Um, so these prayers are holy, you see. Prayers of our prayers are holy at that time. Hmm. That's because we're glorified. Our prayers will be extremely holy. But the scripture continues. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holiness to the Lord of hosts. All right. Like the bowls before the altar in heaven. So this phrase, which is in capitals, both times it's mentioned, is extremely significant. The Feast of Tabernacles is when the priests of the Ark of the Covenant are glorified. There isn't many times when the Bible uses all capitals. But he capitalized it both times to show how those two things are related. Aaron's crown and the Feast of Tabernacles. That's because the Levitical priesthood is being transferred to the Bride of Christ when they are glorified. Look at Psalm 80, 89, 38 through 40. Thou hast <coughs> kept, 
cast off <coughs> and abhorred, thou hast been wroth with thine anointed, wroth or angry because of sin. <coughs> thou hast made void the covenant of thy servant, thou hast profaned his crown by casting it to the ground. Now this is speaking about the persecution. Temporarily casting our crowns to the ground until we conform our lives to him and until this persecution is completely over. Thou hast broken down all his hedges. Now these are hedges of protection. Thou hast brought his strongholds to ruin. <clears throat> this, is, this is an exact description of what happened to us during this persecution period. Our hedge of protection was removed by the enemy, but God allowed it for the refining of the saints. <clears throat> But let's see what happens at the end of the persecution. Psalm 103, 1 through 10. Oops. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, <clears throat> who crowns thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He, makes known his, he made known his ways to Moses and his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger <coughs> and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide or chasten, neither will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Proverbs 4, 7-9 through 9. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all your getting, get understanding. Exalt wisdom, and she shall promote thee. She shall bring you to honor when you embrace her. She shall give to your head an ornament of grace. A crown of glory shall she deliver to you. And how do you get wisdom? By diligently seeking the Lord. And how do we diligently seek the Lord? By reading the Bible. And by prayers and by living a life pleasing to God. Nahum 3, 16-18 you have multiplied your merchants above the stars of heaven. This is God speaking to the Antichrist. You have multiplied your merchants above the stars of heaven. The canker worm spoils and flees away. Your crowned are as the locusts, and your captains as the great grasshoppers, which camp in the hedges in the cold day. But when the sun arises, they flee away, and their place is not known where they are. Your shepherds slumber. O king of Assyria, your nobles shall dwell in the dust. Your people are scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathers them. Alright. So Nineveh is also referenced in this verse, which I'm not going to read right now, but Nineveh today is Mosul in Iraq. So this is speaking about the Assyrian who comes against Israel and whom the glorified Bride of Christ will defend uh, Israel and Jerusalem against them. Uh, it's so interesting because in Revelations, a locust with a crown is referenced again. In Revelations 9-7, the shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. So this is some sort of high-tech weapon. But the locusts will flee at the rising of the sun, and when the sun rises refers to the return of Jesus Christ with all his angels and saints. So the Assyrian with his locust army will flee away when the army of Christ returns. That fits perfectly. As it says elsewhere in scripture that the glorified bride of Christ will defend Jerusalem against the Assyrian. <sighs> Zechariah 6, <coughs> 10 through 15. Just a sec. Crutch! <coughs> <coughs> 
take boom <coughs> take of them of the cap take of them of the captivity even of Heldai of Tobijah and of Jediah which are come from Babylon and come thou the same day and go into the house of Josiah the son of Zephaniah and take silver and gold and make crowns and set them upon the head of Joshua the son of Josedek the high priest and speak unto him, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch. And he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. And the crowns shall be to Helam, and to Tobijah, and to Jediah, and to Hen, the son of Zephaniah, for a memorial in the temple of the Lord. And they that are far off shall come and build in the temple of the Lord, and ye shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. And this shall come to pass if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God in the Bible. The speech of Zechariah to Joshua is a sign to him about the latter days, which is now. It speaks about the bride of Christ coming to Jerusalem from all over the world, the glorified bride of Christ. The branch is Jesus Christ, and he builds the temple of the Lord, which is us. We are the temple. Taking the crowns of silver and gold relates to Psalm 68, 13, which says, Though ye have a lien, which means a debt, among the pots, the pots in the potter's hands, which are being shaped and molded in the persecution, is what is being referred to. Yet shall ye be as the wings of a dove covered with silver, and her feathers with yellow gold. This refers to our Holy Spirit power and transformation. 1 Corinthians 15, 51-53 Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. It speaks about the transformation. 1 Peter 1.4 elaborates on who this, corruption, this incorruption pertains to exactly. It is an inheritance, incorruptible, and undefiled, and that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In the last time is the latter days, which is right now. But getting back to Joshua, Joshua was, Joshua was the leader chosen by God to come into the promised land after Moses died. This prefigures our coming into our inheritance, which is to be, which is to also be the chosen priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, covenant of God's promise to us that he made before the foundation of the world. The Levitical priesthood is passed on to us, which is also shown in Zechariah, when God says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. And the vision of the two trees pouring out the oil was shown in a vision to Zechariah. The two trees are the tribe of Joseph and the house of Jacob, which are devout Christians and devout Jews who go through the refinement process, or the persecution in other words. 1 Corinthians 9, 24-25 Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize. So run that ye may obtain. So we strive to run this race to obtain Christ within us, to be conformed to Christ's image. And every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. He's talking about other runners. But we strive to obtain an incorruptible crown. So some strive for mastery in material things, but our kingdom is above, so we strive for mastery over all things, both material and spiritual, especially in regard to provocations.
Zechariah 9, 9 through 16. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king comes to thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon a donkey, and upon the colt of a foal of a donkey, which is just what Jesus Christ did to fulfill that scripture. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, which is the United States, and the horse from Jerusalem. Ephraim is actually uh, the United States and the Anglo-Saxons in Europe. So he cuts off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem because Israel is complicit in this persecution and the battle bow shall be cut off. That's the bow of the enemy. And he shall speak peace unto the heathen and his dominion shall be even his dominion shall be from sea even to sea <coughs> and from the river even to the ends of the earth. Uh, that's the river of living water that goes out to the ends of the earth when Jesus Christ returns and has an everlasting dominion over all humanity. As for you also, by the blood of your covenant, this is our covenant with Jesus Christ, I have sent forth your prisoners out of the pit wherein there is no water. This is referring to a spiritual pit where there is no living water of Jesus Christ. Turn you to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope, even today do I declare that I will render double unto thee. In scripture it is the tribe of Joseph who receives a double portion or double blessing because of everything we've been through and because we were chosen to go through this whole thing from the foundation of the world. When I have bent or conformed, in other words, Judah for me, filled the bow with Ephraim, Ephraim, the Lord's bow, and raised up thy sons, O Zion, against thy sons, O Greece, and made thee as the sword of a mighty man. And the Lord Jesus shall be seen over them, and his arrow shall go forth as the lightning, and the Lord God shall blow the trumpet, and shall go with the whirlwinds of the south. The Lord of hosts shall defend them, and they shall devour or consume and subdue with sling stones, and they shall drink and make a noise as through wine, and they shall be filled like bowls. These were the bowls of the altar. Remember from the previous scripture, full of incense or prayers, and full of the anointing oil of Aaron, and as the corners of the altar. So on the corners of the altar were horns, so our horns will be exalted through the covenant of Jesus Christ's holy blood. And the Lord their God shall save them in that day as the flock of his people, and they shall be as the stones of a crown, lifted up as an ensign or banner upon his land. This shows that it is the glorified bride of Christ that is the ensign or banner that the Lord, the Lord raises up over Jerusalem and over the world. Philippians 4.1 Therefore, my brothers, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Philippians 4.3 Whose names are in the book of life. Pro Proverbs 4.9 Wisdom shall give to your head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. 2 Timothy 4.7-8 I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. <clears throat> henceforth, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me that day, and not only to me, but also unto all of them that love his appearing. The last crown reference is Jesus' own crown that he wore on the day he was crucified, and this was a crown of suffering suffering that he endured for us. It prefigures the crown of suffering that we are all wearing now. 
when Jesus' own disciples were arguing about which of them was going to sit next to him in heaven, he said to them, Can you drink of the cup that I drink from? This was a reference to the cup of suffering that he was going to drink from shortly when he made that speech. And this is the cup, or the cup of suffering that we now all drink from. We drink from his own cup of suffering through this persecution as a reflection of his own ministry. But this crown of thorns will become a garland of flowers fit for a bride when we are fused with Jesus Christ as one body. The taking of Jesus Christ's blood during communion is the receiving of the crown of his covenant that he made by sacrificing himself for us, by shedding his blood for us. Receiving his body is receiving his fire in his word and his living water. These two things go together, the reading of the word of God and the partaking of his body in communion. These are two aspects of the same thing, and they mean the same thing. Okay, that's the end of my talk today, and I hope everybody goes in peace, and I hope everybody learns something. If you need prayers, please send me a message, and I will include you in my nightly prayers. Go in peace.